それなんでなんでどこでそれなんで Good evening. I'm John Gastright, and I have the privilege of welcoming all of you to this special edition of the Project 2049 Strategic Competition Webinar Series. A fireside chat with Project 2049 Chairman Randy Shriver and Ambassador Ryozo Kato, the longest serving Japanese ambassador to the United States in the post World War II era. Ambassador Kato brings truly remarkable career of insights. Into how to foster strong alliances and carefully manages challenges in pursuit of a healthy international relationship. Just touching on the wave tops of his remarkable career, he joined the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in 1965. Think about that. He started specializing in US policy in 1981 as the director of the National Security Affairs Division in the North American Affairs Bureau. He was first posted to the embassy in Washington in 1987. First as a counselor and then an administrator. And in 1984, he was Japan's consul general in San Francisco. After returning to Tokyo, where he ultimately served as deputy minister of foreign affairs, Ambassador Kato returned to the United States in September 2001 at an obviously pivotal moment in American history as ambassador to the United States. And as mentioned before, he served in that capacity until 2008. And on the fun fact side of things, after concluding his government service, He served as the commissioner of Japan's professional baseball league for a period of time. And just as an aside, we just went on a pretty remarkable tour of some of the memorabilia he keeps in his house. So maybe Randy will touch on some of that. Now, it goes without saying that we are incredibly honored to have the ambassador this evening to learn from his decades of experience and better understand how the US, Japan, and our allies and partners can work together to face and overcome. The many challenges we face in the world today. However, before we get to Chairman Shriver and Ambassador Kato, let me address some of the necessary to maximize the experience of our worldwide virtual audience. So here we go. There are two ways to participate in today's live QA session that will be moderated by my colleague Jennifer Hong at the conclusion of the fireside chat. One, you may send directly you may send questions directly to us at Ask at project 2049.net. That's A S K at project P R O J E C T 2049.net. If you RSVP'd for the event, we sent an event reminder from that email just minutes ago. And you can respond directly to that email with your questions if you'd like. Number two, if you have a YouTube account and are watching this stream on Project 2049's YouTube channel, You can submit your questions in the YouTube chat box, and our team will connect, collect them and send them to Jennifer. Now, please remember to include your name and affiliation when submitting questions. Questions with names and affiliations will be prioritized. Now, with that, it is my distinct honor and privilege to turn the floor over to my boss, Chairman of the Project 2049 Institute, the Honorable Randy Shriver. Randy? Great, John, thank you very much. And、uh, good evening to those in the Washington area and in the United States. Good morning to friends in Tokyo and in the Indo Pacific region.、Uh, you know, we do a lot of events at Project 2049 through a typical year. I can't think an event,、uh, of an event that I was more excited about than this one to、uh, reconnect with somebody that I had the privilege of working with in government, but somebody who I greatly admire and respect. And、uh, have the opportunity really to learn something from him every time we have a chance to speak. And even tonight, as we were preparing,、uh, I had、uh, the chance to hear some interesting anecdotes about some of the、uh, famous Major League Baseball players Ambassador Cotto has come across in his very distinguished career.、Uh, but we want to、uh, use this time to learn from you and, and hear your thoughts on contemporary issues. But I also want to take advantage of the fact that. Uh, your lifetime really spans the,、uh, the history of, of the US Japan relationship and alliance. And you've been such a remarkable contributor to building the alliance and alliance management. So, if, if you're agreeable, I'd like to also include some questions about your、uh, background, your personal experiences, because I think our audience would find that fascinating. And with that in mind, I might just start by.、Um, Uh, pointing out to our audience,、uh, Ambassador Kato, you were born just a few months before the United States and Japan went to war.、Uh, so your, your lifetime literally went from peace to war to peace and alliance building.、Uh, 
Um, I won't, uh, I, I, I was doing a bit of math in my head. I, I suppose you probably don't remember a lot about the war years, but, but perhaps you do, but you certainly wouldn't remember the, uh, the US occupation period and the transition. Uh, as, as one of our great alliance managers, can you tell us uh, what are your very first memories of dealing with the United States, dealing with uh, maybe the uh, US force presence? What were your impressions as a boy when you first uh, came across uh, US service members and, and other uh, US citizens? Yes, uh, see, as far as I'm concerned, I didn't have any um, strong feeling toward the U.S. and the servicemen, were well, U.S. occupation uh, offices. And see, my memory is really my memory with the United States began with the baseball in 1949. San Francisco Seals, San Francisco Seals, Triple A, visited Japan and had played seven games, all seven, seven games they won, lopsidedly. Hey, this is the American baseball. To me already, there are many, many uh, semi-god type of Japanese professional baseball players at that time. However, compared to American baseball, the Japanese baseball looks very small. And in 1955, this is 10 years after the end of the Second World War, New York Yankees visited Tokyo. And the next year, 1956, Brooklyn Dodgers, not, not yet the uh, Los Angeles Dodgers, Brooklyn Dodgers visited Japan. Oh, there's a powerful team, so good. And one memory, all American players are very kind to kids, including like myself, baseball kids. One game I went to see, there and one about around half before the game, there was a lineup waiting for a sign of Jackie Robinson. I was in that line, and two guys, two boys before me, time was up. Jackie Robinson apologized. Yeah, I have to go back to the field, ah. and he stopped all the so just because of two two kids, <laughs> different kids. I missed <laughs> his autograph. <laughs> Well, but all mostly it's a fond memory in my case. And uh, the big reason is that I wasn't in Tokyo. I wasn't exposed to the opportunities and uh, meeting frequently with American soldiers in the camp base. And the uh, Akita Prefecture was very quiet. No US bases, nothing. That's one of the reasons. And also, my uh, 10 years and 11 years old older brothers told me about why this and the war happened, how Japan lost, and then what we have to do under the US occupation to rebuild the country or something like that. Therefore, in a way, it was a rather, uh, so, rather, rather, I, uh, the more positive, I may, I may say, encounter in my case with the United States and the Americans. I was very. So you joined. Thank you. That's uh, that's really fascinating. Uh, that your introduction was through baseball, and and uh, that helped foster some positive feelings about the relationship. Uh, you joined the Foreign Service in 1965, which was. An interesting time in the relationship. Uh, we'd gone through the treaty renewal, which was quite controversial in Japan. A lot of protests in the uh, 60, 61 time period. Yeah. Um, but uh, certainly with the, the uh, beginning of the Vietnam War for the United States, uh, the theories of uh, communism spreading in the region, the U.S.-Japan alliance was becoming critically important. What inspired you to join the Foreign Service and did you have an eye on U.S.-Japan relations at the earliest stage or was that something that uh, your ministry identified for you? Well, actually, 100% to be honest with you, what prom prompted me to be interested in, the, in becoming a diplomat that 
if I can be a diplomat, I can go overseas. And if in the event I should be uh, fortunate enough to go to the United States, I can see the Major League Baseball teams. <laughs> and uh, I was non-political, the University of Tokyo elsewhere. And uh, yes, lots of and, uh, snake dances and uh, political activists and uh, students. Uh, that was a no noisy time, as you know. President Ivan Eisenhower's visit to Japan was cancelled because of this heavy demonstration you know, against against the US-Japan Security Alliance. But in retrospect, the Japan I think, uh, leadership, most of them, was very cons consistent. In having that get through, we have to have the, this an alliance treatment with the United States. But then, according to Prime Minister Kishi's, according to Prime Minister Kishi's uh, statement, the silent majority, by far, uh, by far the majority of the silent Japanese, silent voices supporting Kishi administration, and I think it was right. Hmm. Well, your career. Uh... In terms of alliance management and dealing with the US, I, we were looking at the timeline and uh, it seems like you always showed up just when we needed you. You uh, came to Washington in the uh, mid to late 80s, 1987 time frame, And uh, that was a, also a tough time in US-Japan relations. Uh, I recall members of Congress taking Toshiba products to the steps of the Capitol and smashing them. And there was a lot of controversy over the uh, trade relationship and and Japan's quite frankly uh, excellent economic performance, which stoked fears that we would somehow be overcome by Japan's economy. Um, but you showed up and and uh, helped guide us through that. What uh, what what do you recall from that period of the late '80s when we had a, a stretch of of real difficulty? Oh uh, yeah, I think uh, that's exactly the time when the Sort of sharing the basic values has become more important. You see, and to me, the world of and the business is not necessarily a place for shared values. It's just a competition. And then, what is needed in strengthening our alliance is for both of us to share the values in more concrete terms, not just share the uh, uh, burden sharing, responsibility sharing. We could have a uh, sort of a um, common perception for a proper division of roles and missions with Japan and the United States under this umbrella of the alliance. Mm. That was the sort of backstop against which I've been working as the uh, and sort of diplomat that day. And also, I, I, I observed the stark reality of the national security when I was in Egypt from 1977 to 1981, in three, nearly three years, when Ambassador uh, when Anwar Sadat the Egyptian president. He did lots and lots of things, you know. Amazing leader. And he was assassinated a couple of months before and after I left in Egypt. But then mm. looking at the reality in the Middle East, through Egypt, Israel, and a couple other countries, I came to be reminded they knew what really this and national security means. That helped when I uh, give a thought to what we should do to the strengthening of US-Japan alliance in my later career. In 1987, when you were helping us navigate that difficult time, uh, I think that's when you first started working with our friend and, and colleague and my former boss, Richard Armitage, when he was uh, Assistant Secretary of Defense and so many other friends like Torkel Patterson. Um, you all uh, went off and did different things, and then you came back together again at, at exactly the right time. Like I said, you show up when we need you most. You came to Washington again in September 
2001 at the time uh, the United States was attacked. And uh, there was your friend, Mr. Armitage, as deputy secretary and Torkel uh, at the NSC. And I think that really showed uh, relationships matter, relationship building matters in the context of an, an alliance. Uh, but Mr. Armitage always said, uh, Rios Okato is the best diplomat I've ever seen. And he'd always then add, now, remember, I didn't say Japanese diplomat, the best diplomat I've ever seen. Uh, so you you made an impression on him in the 80s, but particularly after the uh, attack of, on 9-11 and the work we did with Japan. Uh, what are your recollections from that uh, post-September 11th attack in the United States and the work we did as an alliance in the aftermath? Well, this uh, September 11th which took place shortly before I arrived in Washington DC as ambassador. It was a really, a truly shocking thing. And although compared to the staggering number of casualties on the American side, 24 Japanese, pretty good of them, you know, talented guys, they were killed mm -hmm. in New York by terrorist attack and Pennsylvania as well, of Pennsylvania as well. So and I think this worked as a uh, opportunity for enhancing a descent of the Pacific in Japan, that even the United States is not 100% unvulnerable to the kind of surprise attack, including and, uh, terrorists. And the US-Japan relationship should be the one in which both help each other, not just the United States defends Japan, Japan does not defend the United States, not that kind of thing. Or net, net assessment uh, like thing, and including all hard and soft elements. US and Japan must help each other. And in doing so, Japanese diplomats like myself should be Japan first guy. And the rich army said he's an America first guy. He's an, and you too, you, you very kind, friendly to Japan, but still, for you, the America should be a priority number one. Likewise, for the Japanese diplomats, Japan should be the priority number one. On that basis, a real strong alliance can be forged at the level of the nation and between the, those people who administrate, who, who, who manage the US-Japan alliance. And in so doing, uh, the important thing is to have a bunch of quiet people, I call them uh, gardeners from time to time. Garden is beautiful. Spectators love it. But the garden cannot beautify itself automatically. After all uh, spectators go, night time, dawn time, good gardeners come out. And without any, any audience, they prune water and give fertilizer and to keep the garden beautiful. And then in the morning, when the first spectator shows up, the garden is uh, beautiful as uh, yesterday before, as before. And something like that. Those, you know, the larger the number of good gardeners for US Japan Alliance on both sides of the Pacific, the larger the number, the more solid the alliance will become. This is the important thing for us to keep in mind, even at this, uh, this time of the IT age. Oh, that's a wonderful analogy. Um, and you, 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 you just brought us to the present by saying, uh, even in this day and age, uh, so we're, we're traveling quickly through uh, the time in your career, but uh, maybe we can just take a few moments and talk about uh, the state of the Alliance today and the strategic environment in which we're operating. Uh, as somebody who poured so much into the alliance, uh, what's what do you feel about the state of the alliance today, and uh, how far we've come, and maybe some things that uh, you're both impressed with, and and some things you think we still need to to work on together. Well, the state of the alliance is uh, really strong. You see, uh, the outcome, result of the opinion opinion poll taken by the cabinet office. November last year, but then the outcome was released this past February. 
to which, according to which, the approval rate of popularity of the United States and Americans to Japan's Japanese was as high as 88.6%. And the comparative figure to China, the record low of 20.6%. 88.6%. Point six percent versus twenty point six percent, and those who uh, claim for the further strengthening of the U.S.-Japan Security Alliance is ninety-two percent. I think, and this is very reciprocal, more or less, and uh, so at the other end of the Pacific, in your country as well. But having said that, though, the one opinion poll, which has taken several years back, but you know, ever since the no, you know, the no uh, opinion, opinion poll was taken, the question was addressed to 64 countries, including Taiwan. And the question was, are you ready to fight yourself if foreign power uh, make an aggression to, home, to, to, to your home country? So this, Chinese and uh, Russians, I really don't know how this opinion poll was taken. Uh, incidentally, the opinion poll was taken by BBC International uh, several years back. Chinese and Russians, 80% or plus, said, yes, we are ready. And Americans, 55%. French, 38%. Koreans, 42%. German, Germany. Second lowest, 28%, we are ready. Japan was the lowest among the 64, including Taiwan. The number was 11%. On the other hand, uh, the different opinion poll taken quite recently showed that 83% of the Japanese would like to be born again as a Japanese if they were second line. The same, and the answer to the same question by Koreans is, 70% plus Koreans say, we are not, we don't like to be born again as the Koreans in the next life. Mm. But then this Korea says, 42% of Koreans say, yes, we are ready to fight for our country. And Japan, just 11% of the Japanese say, we are ready to fight for the company. That's, there's a, the kind of, and a, quite a bit of a gap between yeah. these two figures. That's the kind of thing I have to, for Japan to I mean, keep in mind. In the case of emer emergency, what we should do under the US-Japan alliance and to maintain the effectiveness and uh, credibility of the US-Japan alliance. Mm. Do you think we have a, a shared uh, understanding of what Xi Jinping and China is up to? Do we, do we share a common view of the challenge and and uh, if not, where would that gap be? Because I think at a foundational level, having a shared understanding of the strategic environment, which I think is being driven by China's assertiveness and their, their ambition uh, is, is critical before we even think about alliance activities. Are, are we on the same page on this critical question? I think there's a pretty good uh, shared perception between the United States and Japan toward China, for that matter to Russia as well. Uh, actually, from uh, around the uh, 20, 2015, 2016, 2017, at that time, the threat perception of th threat perception toward China was, I think, higher among Japanese intellectuals than among American counterparts. American, uh, American uh, guys and the professors and then the officials, whoever else, they are more lenient to China, in my view, than to Japan at that time. Now, these, now, these days, recently, after the Trump administration, this is, seems to be uh, reversed. But anyway, by and large, we share the common perception that the preoccupation number one, or challenge number one, facing Japan and the United States, short, medium, long term, is China, not Russia, not other countries. 
And within that uh, broader set of challenges, uh, you and I over the years have talked a number of times about uh, threats to Taiwan. And uh, I would say, you know, the interesting thing about being a political appointee in the United States is you go into government, work two or three years, leave, come back, you know, some amount of time later, and you get snapshots of where things stand. I would say the issue of Taiwan has moved the furthest in the U.S.-Japan uh, dialogue and, and the perceptions of what our alliance should be thinking about and preparing. Um, is that, uh, would you share that view? Is it, has Japan's views changed on this or evolved, or is this a matter of a, a subject that was uh, maybe difficult because of Japan's uh, history there, the previous colonial era, the the, um, uh, the desire not to confront China or anger China too much, but these sentiments were already there, or is it China's activities and behavior that have heightened uh, Japan's sensitivities to the security interests and what Taiwan represents? Well, this, there is a kind of difference between the uh, well informed, well educated people and others in Japan. But among those uh, educated Japanese people, pretty much a sense of an, uh, apprehension, anxiety towards China. You see, there's a sh and a common feeling among the, I think, uh, the Jap Japanese that the uh, China can be further prosperous, or China can be less prosperous in coming year, years. But whichever they may be, China's foreign policy and China's security policy will be aggressive, never benign. Mm. The further China become, China will be increasingly more, increasingly more uh, aggressive never benign in their foreign policy, security policy. And China becomes further prosperous, the same. China's foreign policy and Chinese uh, secu security policy, security strategy will continue to be, or even more aggressive. Never we can expect it to be benign. So be no benign China on that sense, on that score for many more years to come. Is uh and on, on the Taiwan incident, yeah. on the Taiwan, yes, the, the Japan Taiwan relationship, not just at the sort of central government level, but the people's people to people level, it's very good, very much like our relationship with Australians and uh, and the Americans and Australians. And there's a very warm spot in our hearts for Taiwan. But what we can do in the event something happens in Taiwan. Taiwan or Taiwan Straits. What Japan can do may be limited, but uh, at the same time, we have to do something. We have to do something. We have to beef up our defense and uh, capability. That kind of uh, sense is uh, being heightened in Japan these days. Mm. Thank you. Of course, another issue related to China and the overall security environment is uh, the potential for Russia and China to emerge out of this conflict as even closer strategic partners, maybe the hierarchy shifting with China becoming even more the senior partner in the relationship. But for many years, uh, we tried to caution ourselves about our policies and, and to avoid driving China and Russia together. Uh, it seems that whether it was environmental conditions or policy or whatever it might be, um, they are, are firmly together and uh, China is sticking by Russia in this conflict in Ukraine. Uh, what does that mean for Japan? Do you, do you, assess, do you assess it that way, first of all, that, that uh, they, their strategic partnership is more meaningful? What does that mean for Japan and what does that mean for our alliance? Well, of course, and, um, we have to be better prepared for anything which might, might happen in this area as a, and after there's an Ukrainian aggression <clears throat> and the strengthening, quote unquote, strengthening, strengthening of China-Russia relationship. 
and uh, they can do quite a, they can do, uh, they can inflict quite a bit of bad things on the U.S., on Japan, on Taiwan, whoever else in this region. However, medium long term, I don't think that China and Russia can maintain a long standing sort of uh, relationship with with each other. You see, Russia. Its GDP, as many people observe it, the Russian GDP is lower than, smaller than the South Korea. Republic of Korea ranks only 12th or so in, uh, in the world. And uh, the Russian economy will be drastically down after this uh, uh, Ukrainian situation. Which means, even if the uh, relationship tie between China and Russia Get stronger. It means more that the Russia become an apparent little brother to China, which doesn't fit with the sort of pride the leader like Putin. Junior partner, little brother, he hates that kind of concept, don't you think? Ch China will also be. Uh, quite an annoyed, annoyed, annoyed by this move of Putin. Although China has to take a sort of neutral stand for some time, Putin might turn out. Putin and Russia might turn out to be a sort of uh, burden. A burden on China. That's a possibility there, and also there is a India. This is an, another important factor. When we think about three countries, China, India, and Russia, Russia-India relationship is strong through the military deals. Indo-China Indo relationship is difficult because of Kashmir. So all in all, I think medium, long term, medium, long term, I'm guardedly optimistic. No such a strong development of the good relationship among these three. The problem rests with more or less rests with the short term thing. Mm. The short term thing incidentally includes uh, China might do to Taiwan in a couple of years and several years time. Well, I, I'll, I'll choose to underscore the more optimistic note of the medium and long term because I think we need uh, we need to hear something positive about uh, this the situation, which is uh, so tragic in many ways. Um, let me ask, uh, we have just a few more minutes before we transition to audience questions. Um, you know, there's this expression uh, that sometimes comes up in our alliance, Gaiatsu, the practice of uh, foreign pressure or foreign advice uh, to Japan to do certain things. I often thought that there should be the reverse. We should be better at listening uh, to Japanese advice and uh, a little pressure in our direction. Um, we've gone through some some difficult times, a, one of the more difficult political transitions in our history, certainly uh, in the last 150 years. Um, there, we've heard some question whether or not the United States is a reliable partner in, in some respects. Uh, what what Advice would you give us as an alliance partner? What did what would you like to see the United States do more of, better of? Uh, is it trade rejoining TPP? Is it something on the security front? Uh, what what should we uh, should we be doing in the United States to be a better partner to Japan? Well, unlike many other colleagues colleagues of mine in Japan, again, I'm pretty optim optimistic to the future of the United States. Many people talk about a division of the United States. However, in history, the United States is a country of divisions, starting from George Washington time and Jefferson. For him to become the president, 30 round polling was needed to elect him as a president and civil war. And uh, Theodore Roosevelt time, it's, I think, there was a tremendous division in the American societies and Vietnam War era. And today, always there are the serious divisions in the American community. 
somehow, somehow the United States has overcome these things. You know. President Trump seems to be like a wildfire, a huge wildfire. You may like it or not. You can't distinguish it quickly, but it's an, somewhat like a wildfire which happened to Yellowstone many years ago. It's devastating. However, after this wildfire, fresh greens start to sprout and even more beautiful national park appeared there, you know, sort of thing. I'm myself an optimistic to the future of the United States because, partly because the military strength, that sort of hard power, but also as uh, Joe Nye said then already, the tremendous soft power. You see, United States population increased by uh, millions over the 10 years, as you know. Well, and th this is because there are so many people on the face of Earth who might become, wish to become Americans. A comparable number to China, Russia, India, I don't know. Very insignificant, I think, if there should be any. The soft power of the United States is never underestimated. And of course, again, like a net uh, assessment, and the national strength should be measured not by the military strength, economic strength, technology, technological strength, but the, the, uh, the, the spirit of the people, mm. will of the people, and some uh, lubricate, lubricate sort of things among the peoples, the unifying power. The, this concentration power of nerves when incident and then some incident happens. But lots of the US democracy is much stronger than many people expect it to be. Therefore, the, so, so therefore, the basic thing for Japan to do to strengthen further the US Japan alliance is three. Once Japan meet, you know, Japan uh, needs to build up its defense capability. And, uh, defensive posture maintained, the, but the effective, credible defense capability. It's be, be, beef up consultation through, with consultation through the United, uh, consulta, through the consultation with the United States, it's one thing. The second thing, further foreign direct investment, both ways. Japan ranks number three, I think, in number, aggregate amount of foreign direct, FDI, foreign direct investment. And only in the United States, only after UK and Canada. Not necessarily vice versa from the United States to Japan. This FDI from the US to Japan is small. Well, the Japanese take the blame for that, of course. But uh, this FDI is an, uh, another important element because in the United States, all 40 and 50 states are somewhat like independent countries. Hmm. And Japan is a rare country who has got the FDI in each and all 50 states. Mm. This is, I think, an important element. The, the third one is further an exchange of people. Uh, in the Japanese students to the United States, US students coming to Japan should be further increased. It's too small compared to the number of China and Korea, Saudi Arabia, and so forth. And we should strengthen the efforts to nurture the good researchers and scholars. Japanese scholars studying the United States and vice versa. America studies researchers studying Japan. That should be quickly increased. Those three are very important, I think. Well, that's wonderful. You mentioned uh, uh, students and investing in the young. My, so my last question before turning it over to uh, Ms. Hong Wetzel is, uh, given your remarkable career, uh, if you were speaking to uh, young Japanese students or American students who are considering a career in diplomacy, were interested in U.S.-Japan relations, what advice would you give them? Well, I, to American students, well, Japan is a way more interesting country and enjoyable country than they might think it is. Because you see, the entire knowledge of Japan, Japanese, is still limited compared to European countries in the United States. 
there was a well-informed people among the very well-informed people. The rating of Japan, I think, is high, but this should be shared by the young and upcoming people in general over the state. Therefore, I call to the Americans by uh, when I say I call on to reach out to the Americans and Americans in each and all states, not just in Washington, New York, Los Angeles, Chicago, elsewhere, but in each and all states, youngsters in there. We'd like to come up with some and, uh, projects and uh, programs to foster that kind of a sort of exchange between the United States. And to the Japanese, I don't have to say anything because the popularity of the United States is quite something. As you know, these days, these good high school students, top cream high school students, go directly from the high school, Japanese high school to Ivy League in the United States, a good other, other good university colleges in the United States directly without going through University of Tokyo and University of Kyoto and those Japanese colleges and universities. That number is rising quickly. So get uh, the United States cannot be understood through online meetings or just photos or something like that. Go there, meet with people. That's the best way to know, to understand the United States. You don't have to necessarily like the United States. You don't have to become the fan of the United States, but surely you have to understand the United States. That's the message to my. Oh, thank you. You know, you started uh, one of your first comments uh, based on a question I asked you was you first saw American baseball in 1949 when the San Francisco Seals very badly beat the Japanese uh, team they were playing. But I would point out that by the time you became baseball commissioner in Japan, Japan won the World Baseball Classic. So you must have been watching very closely as a young boy and helped Japan uh, develop the kind of baseball programs that are actually the, the best in the world now. So, uh, Jen, uh, over to you for audience questions. All right. Thank you so much. My name is Jennifer Hong. I am the senior, pro I'm senior director at Project 2049, and it's just been an honor to sit and hear and learn from you, Ambassador Kato. Thank you for joining us today. We have several questions. Um, we will start with the Russian attack on Ukraine. Um, we have lots of viewers interested in this topic, and you two have both um, done a great job in addressing several elements about that conflict. But I would like to combine questions from Aaron Opal from Smith College, David Asher from Hudson Institute, and Tina Chung from Voice of America China Branch. Do you see this as entering a new Cold War? In addition, what should the United States and Japan do to jointly enhance deterrence to prevent China from taking similar actions against Taiwan? We'll start with you, Ambassador. Okay, thank you very much. That's an excellent question and a difficult question. Uh, for me to be a full answer to that. However, uh, the situation is not just back to the Cold War. It goes back to very beyond Cold War, even the time of First World War, Second World War, before Second World War. Uh, in that day, whole international uh, uh, order meets the sort of challenge. Look at how United States, uh, United Nations Security Council did not work in these circumstances. And two members, uh, two permanent members out of five, five most responsible nations for the peace and stability of the world. They are defying the international law almost on a daily basis. Typical case is Soviet Union. Therefore, on the one hand, many things we have to do. One, we have to really give a serious thoughts what the United Nations should turn out to be in order for that to be, be more effective, universal international organization, organizations who can do something good to, to stabilize the situation in Ukraine or wherever else, that kind of thing. And But in the short term, I think, yes, it's an alarm bell is ringing and this is in the benefit of japan and the united states time for further strengthening of this alliance by more precise precise analysis precise analysis of what the 
roles and missions of the United States and Japan should be under the circumstances in concrete terms, force structure, and something like that. Thank you. We have another question from the audience. How do you believe Japan's views of the People's Republic of China has evolved over the last 20 years? Well, as I mentioned in the in the initial and um, initial part, I Chinese popul and pop popularity of the Ch China and Chinese People's Republic of China and Chinese are very much down in Japan, and twenty point six percent, twenty point six percent according to an opinion poll. In the same opinion poll, the popularity of the United States and Americans was. 88.6%. So this gap, see, in 1972, this is incidentally, this 1972 is a very meaningful year. As Mr. Dr. Schreiber mentioned, baseball, this is the 150th anniversary of baseball having come to Japan from the United States. And this is the 50th anniversary of Okinawa reversion. The Ryukyu Island chain, administrative rights over them was returned back to Japan through peaceful negotiations. Peaceful negotiations, territory Japan was lost, is back. This can be possible. This, can, you know, this was possible only under the US-Japan strong alliance. Compared to that, what's going on with the Northern Territories between Japan and Russia? What is happening to the Senkaku Islands between China and Japan? This really, and under these circumstances, the importance of the US-Japan alliance is outsticking in the idea, of, in the eyes of, or, or, or even among the ordinary people, ordinary Japanese people on the street. So Japan's uh, sen Japan sentiment toward China is at being very low. It's in, uh, reducing very quickly. And uh, I hope uh, this should be kept at some reasonable rational level, but then somehow it's going down and down right now. Challenge now, Ch China is in clearly the challenge number one, preoccupation number one for Japan. That perception is pretty widely shared among the Japanese. And I think I'm going to pull a moderator's privilege here. I, want, I would like to ask about your other neighbor, the, the Republic of Korea. They just had a new election, um, have a president who's more pro-alliance to to, um, to United States, um, more um, strong, strong against China's you know, kind of the foreign policy that we're hearing from, from the candidate, the president-elect right now. And as, as you know, in our Indo-Pacific strategy that came out, it really talked about improving cooperation between the United States, Japan, and Korea. What advice would you give to the leaders who want to align their values you know, over the complex history that the, three, the two countries, Japan and you know, South Korea shares as well, but just the three countries to come together to you know, think through regional development and infrastructure, you know, critical technology and supply chain issues? What, what advice would you give them to really succeed in a trilateral context? I, for one, and, uh, wish strongly that the Japan, Korea, South Korea, uh, Republic of China, uh, Republic of Korea, ROK, Republic of Korea relationship gets better. However, it's easier said than done under the present circumstances, honestly. At this end, the quote unquote Korea fatigue is seen. So many negative things happened one after another in the past several years in Korea in terms of use Korea Japan relationship. However, the larger picture is that what we should do to the new, further nuclearization of North Korea, DPRK, and what we should do to China. Then we suddenly need the kind of you know, positive contribution from the Republic, Republic of Korea. There should be a minimum necessary degree of meeting with the mind among the United States, South Korea, and Japan on these and the crucial, critical points of concern for the region, China, Taiwan, North Korean nuclear development, and so forth. So, I know the gradually, not, not overly uh, ambitious, 
but the step by step, the leadership, the leadership relationship of trust and mutual understanding should be so should be worked out among the three leaders. President of the United States, Prime Minister of Japan, President of Korea. And in between the United States and Japan, virtually no, no problem. And uh, the problem exists only between the Japanese Prime Minister and Korean President. And uh, in order to improve this bilateral relationship between Korea and Japan, again, I have to say, I, sorry, I have to say this, but we need a help from the United States. Thank you. Um, we have uh, one more, actually, we may be able to squeeze in two more questions here. So one, um, this question is from Surya Nara, uh, Narayanan. How can the United States address criticisms of its um, lessened economic and political presence in Asia as the regional comprehensive economic partnership unfolds? Oh, first time, very disappointed that US doesn't try to accede to the TPP. You see, for example, for us, Japan and the United States, India is very important. India is a small universe, very independent entity. Indian performance toward Ukrainian situation is a bit disappointing. However, we can change India. But India is a small universe, very independent. But then this huge entity, India, has got its face and brain and everything. If its face, 70% of its face, looks toward the United States, United States and Japan, only 30% looking toward China and Russia, then I think it is quite positive for the stability of the region in the Pacific. And in order to do that, in order to do that, United States has to do more to impress upon India. What? And India, that then this relationship with the United States will accrue some benefits to India in economic terms and the other terms, you see. So there is a kind of realm for the United States to do more to include, induce India, so that their face look toward us rather than toward China and Russia, that, that kind of thing. So see, TPP, if the United States could come back to the TPP, it's an ideal thing. But then I have heard, given the present and the sentiment and the, situation in the United States, it's very difficult. But then what are the economic institution, economic framework, trade framework or something like that could be considered in between the United States and India? Maybe in Japan can be a part of that. This is the kind of thing. And also uh, for ASEAN countries, ASEAN countries, ASEAN countries, as you know, very reticent to publicly say, yes, we are for the free and open Indo-Pacific. Well, we are now we are not for China and Russia. ASEAN countries and leaders are too reticent to do that. However, my gut feeling, and my uh, experts, my and colleague experts in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs say, ASEANs, most of the ASEANs, the bottom depth of their heart, they are for the free open in the Pacific region, rather than in, where the United States and Japan and exercise the kind of good leadership than the world where China is taking the leadership. They don't say that publicly, but then for India, uh, for ASEAN countries, again, like India, ASEAN countries needed is a benefit in tangible terms, benefit they can get from the United States. I think there can be some room for Japan and the United States to do more for the ASEAN countries to quietly induce them to be to join in our kind of like okay, we trade have... and finance or military assistance, whatever it is, tangible benefit compared to the tangible benefits offered by China to ASEAN countries, tangible benefits offered by the United States if I can be absolutely forthright. Mm -hmm. It's not adequate. 
That's my impression. Okay. We have so many questions, sir. So you're going to have to come back to our event. We have many, many interests from our audience here. Um, I'm trying to think a really good last question. How about this question? How can the United States, um, what can we do to best support Japan's national security and defense strategy going forward? Japan, uh, the United States is really helping Japan in that sense. However, again, this is a very commonplace thing to have a deeper sort of uh, in context or quiet conversation efforts to better share the perception on key issues then Americans, Japanese, including the uniform people will be very important. This can include the possibility of Japan's relaxing three non-nuclear principles and Japan, whether Japan should go nuclear if the United States extended nuclear umbrella is not effective anymore, it's not effective 100 100% anymore in the Indo-Pacific region, what we should do? That kind of consultation should be strengthened. I am not an advocate for Japan's going straight to the uh, Japan's and a nuclear Japan's becoming a nuclear country. Well, I, Japan's security should be guaranteed through the deterrence emanating from Japan itself, the deterrence emanating from the United States under the US-Japan Security Treaty. And combined in, combined in between these two, we can see a synergy of the enhancement of the strength of the alliance or deterrence. So consultation, 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 without any inhibition. This is what we need. Hey, Randy, do you have anything to add to that? Um, it just seems like we might be able to squeeze in one more question here. Um, thank you. That, that was meant to be my final question, but sir, if I may just ask one more question. Um, defense technology cooperation is one of the foremost pillars of the U.S.-Japan alliance. What lessons should be applied to Taiwan, and are there um, similar <laughs> domestic drivers for jobs and tech spinoffs? Excuse me, can you, is that technology? Yes, defense uh, defense technology cooperation. Oh, yeah, is one of the most yeah. Yes, I and the, the in the context of the security of Taiwan, for example, the transfer of defense technology, well thought out technology, is needed. I think, and uh, th this may not be the direct answer to your questions. However, many countries, including and uh, many countries in this world, tend to be interested in the brand shopping, like the state of the art military <laughs> capabilities or something like that. But before that, the, if we try to cope better with the challenges coming from China, for Taiwan and Japan to have an increased number of submarines and to, in the United States, to deploy, uh, deploy a medium range missile sea-based well, and this is, I think, very effective, very effective. And then U.S. keeping, and this is not about the technology transfer as such, but then U.S. Uh, and U.S. and the reassuring that the forward deployment strategy will be first maintained many years to come. This, I will send a very strong message to all the key countries in the region. But technological transfer, technology cooperation among those countries, they're absolutely important. Technology is really important. Thank you, Ambassador Kato. On behalf of Project 2049, um, the live audience that's tuning in and many more I know will be listening and watching this uh, event later as a recording. We just thank you so much for being part of this conversation. We learned it so much from you, and we hope that you will be joining us again in the future for future events. Thank you very so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a great honor. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Kato. Oh, okay. Okay. We're we, the, the live stream.